do. Good evening. Oh. We are in uh, Genesis, as has been said, Genesis 48. Uh, I couldn't start tonight without um, just saying how unbelievable it is that it was, it's been 18 years since that Tuesday that we all, uh, most of us, um, remember with shock and horror and sadness and anger. And um, so I, I just wanted to lift up those who lost loved ones uh, on the 18 years ago in the September 11th attack. I pray that uh, the Lord bless and strengthen and heal and heal this nation. We're still involved in the aftermath of, of that day. And uh, it just, uh, I felt it was not right if we did not at least mention and remember um, the events of that, of that day. I, I remember it vividly. I can't, I can't believe it's been 18 years. It's just gone with a snap. Um, <clears throat> I was not in the Navy. Um, I was in the Army, but I had the uh, privilege of being on a ship, and that's a story for another day. But I remember one of the things that happened is uh, you would be birthed, uh, and all of a sudden you'd hear over the loudspeaker, now hear this, now hear this. Make all preparations for getting underway. And then you'd hear all these weird clangings and sounds, and everybody would start scurrying and scurrying and scurrying, and the ship was made ready to sail, to leave the berth, and off it went. And when I was um, preparing for this study, and I was trying to come up with a title for it, that's the memory that came to me, which was make, make all preparations for getting underway. Because really, that's what we're doing. Whether we know it or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we are making all preparations for getting underway. This walk that we're on is a pilgrimage. This is not our home. We're only here for a short time. None of us knows exactly how long we're here for. We don't know what tomorrow brings. And so this, this chapter was a particularly hard one for me because as you get into it, you're getting into a situation where that's exactly what's happening. We've been on a walk. It's been quite, a, quite an interesting walk with this family. Abraham, Isaac, now Jacob, his sons, Joseph. And we were in Egypt. The family has been moved there. You've learned that even though his brothers didn't mean it for this purpose, God did. God took and used all that happened to ja Jacob, or Joseph, rather, excuse me. He used everything to preserve that nation of Israel, that family. Little did those brothers deserve it, but there they are. They're safe. It's 17 years later. They've been in Egypt 17 years. The famine is gone. Egypt is thriving. Uh, we, we learned last week, as was taught, that Pharaoh met Jacob. Joseph brought Jacob before his king, his earthly king, Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Uh, it, if you don't mind my going a little sideways for a second, in that culture there was a reason for that. Two reasons. One, Jacob was Pharaoh's grand vizier. He was the second man in Egypt. And so he wanted to pay special honor to the man who had helped save Egypt. Because remember, without Joseph interpreting God's dream, Pharaoh would not have known that he was in, and that his nation was in for a very hard time. And so, also, this was the father 
of this grand vizier, Joseph. And also, he was a man of age. And in that culture, age was considered, first of all, if you lived that long, hallelujah, this was great. When, when you met someone who was old, it was, it was thought that you had gained wisdom in this walk that you had on this earth. So people of age were honored. When someone of age spoke up, that's why the term elder was adopted. It denoted someone who had experience. It denoted someone who had learned something along the way. And here is Joseph's father coming before the throne. And so, yes, Pharaoh allowed Joseph, or Jacob rather, to bless him. And it was, a, it was a mighty privilege that Pharaoh would do that. And now, they're living in Goshen. They have been separated, um, and they're thriving. It's 17 years later, and they are thriving. They're doing quite well. And so as we go back to the scriptures, we're going to start in... Genesis 47, I'm going to bring you back to verse 27 of 47. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, now, if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. Then he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. That's an interesting translation. Actually, it was the head of his staff. Because okay, he sat, and then, then he would have his staff here, and then he would bow his head like this after Joseph swore. We've talked about this before. Why the thigh? Why put your hand under the thigh? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that in that culture. Uh, one, if you're sitting, if someone is putting their hand under your thigh and you're standing, you, you're kneeling, usually you're kneeling before that person, so you're showing sovereignty. You're showing that you have sovereignty, that they have sovereignty over you. Secondly, because they're putting the hand under their thigh, it's close to the source of life. And so you're swearing by the source of life that you're going to do what you have sworn to do. And now we pick it up in... Jacob demonstrated faith. This is not the same Jacob that we started this walk with. This is not the deceiver. This is, this is not the same Jacob who went to his father and with his mother deceived and stole a blessing. Jacob is, as I, as I mentioned, 147 years old. He's seen a lot. He thought his son was dead. It's interesting that in Scripture, you don't get any description of what happened when he found out that Joseph was actually alive. You don't hear or you don't read anything of him telling his sons, say, what? What? Joseph's alive? Wait a minute. Wait, hold, hold. Let, me, let me get this straight. You've been lying to me? all these years, and my son is alive. What? What's the story now? And so on and so forth. You don't get any of that. Now, I don't know if that happened. We're not told if that happened. And we're not told that, that, that if that happened because it's not important. What was important was Jacob's reaction to the news that his son was alive. Praise be to God. I never... He's alive. I, I must see him. I must see him. That's all we're told. We're not told that he grabbed his sons and said, oh, Whoa, 
I don't know how I'd react. How would you? 22 years later? So there was grace in this story. There's enormous grace in this story. And so now, as we know, these, these men are not the same men who we met 22 years ago. Joseph is not the same man that we meet, that we met 22 years ago. Everyone has changed. The, th the thing that's wonderful to me about these verses, these, these chapters in Genesis, as we come to the end of the beginning in Genesis, is that we see change. We see change. We don't see anyone standing still. We actually see people change. When the brothers came to Joseph the second time and Joseph accused them, and accused Benjamin of stealing his silver diviner's cup, the brothers didn't desert him, right? We remember that. The brothers stood united. No, we're not gonna, we'll, no, here we are. And who, who stepped up? Judah stepped up and was willing to put himself in Benjamin's place. And then, it was then that Joseph could reveal himself. It was then that Joseph could say, all right, everybody, everybody clear out except for these men. And he said, I'm your brother. I'm your brother, Joseph. That scene must have been incredible. All of that's happened. Now they're living in Goshen. Everyone came, 70 of them. They were all living in Goshen, and they've been multiplying these 17 years. They've been having children. They are prospering in Egypt, and Egypt itself is prospering. Egypt is the only nation that came out of the famine with quite, quite wealthy. And Pharaoh, who went into the, the uh, famine powerful, has come out of that famine, and now these 17 years later is more powerful than ever, in a nation that's more powerful than ever. And Joseph is, is his grand vizier. Joseph is the one who's made it possible. And we read, we heard la last week and the uh, previous weeks, how the people, st step by step, while they were going through this famine, first gave up all their money, then gave up all their livestock, then gave up all their land, and then finally gave themselves up. In effect, Pharaoh owned it all, lock, stock, and barrel, owned all the people. I would say to you to consider something that we've said before, and that is what's happened before will happen again. Not in the same way, but it will happen again. It came to the point that people, the people made themselves slaves of the government. And then what the government did was the government gave them back, or Joe, through Joseph, gave them back their land with seed. And they were now living on Pharaoh's land, and they would keep all but 20%. 20% of their annual yield they gave to Pharaoh. And I believe, as, I was, as was taught by Don, you think 20%, wow, well, we pay a lot more than that. Israel, which you'll learn in the next chapter, when they became Israel in subsequent chapters, didn't tithe 10%. It actually was more like 30. If you put it all together, 10% 10% was the beginning. To tithe was the beginning. After that, they would come before, and subsequent taxes would be 30%. So 20% wasn't bad. They were back on the land. They were now prosperous, and they were gladly giving 20%. And here we are. And Jacob is realizing that he's, his time is drawing near, and so he's making preparations to get on the way. He didn't know exactly what day it was going to happen, but he knew it was going to happen. And so he decided that he needed to do something that was extremely important. Because in that culture, 
formality was very, very, very important. So let's go to chapter 48 of Genesis, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself, strengthened himself up and sat up at the bed. So Joseph was told, Your father's sick. Your father's dying. And he went, Whoa, wait a minute. And so we tend to forget that in that culture, they didn't have cars, you know? It wasn't easy. Goshen wasn't a, you know, a 20 minute drive from Joseph's house. In order to go visit, you had to make a, quite a preparation. And Joseph had two sons. Manasseh and Ephraim. But something was missing. Something had not happened that was extremely important, especially in that culture. And so he was making haste to do two things. Number one, he wanted to see his father before he died. But also, he needed to do something that was extremely important because he knew that his father was dying. Let's go to Isaiah 40. Scripture says a lot and I was drawn to this one. Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. That's all that's going to last. In this, in this world, that's all that's going to last. We aren't. We're not. We all have a destination. It's not comfortable to think about that. You know, it's not comfortable for me. I've got a birthday coming up, and I look at my age and go, I'm a lot closer today than I was yesterday. <laughs> and you look around you, and this is our reality. You know, we go home, that's our reality. We go to work, that's our reality, mostly. Or we go to see a film, or we hear this, or we hear that, or we're, we're people worried about the politics, or we're worried about whether the left is going to get elected, or the right's going to get elected, or this, or that, and so on and so forth. Um, I had a friend of mine in New York who happened to be quite well-to-do, and I think I may have mentioned this to some of you before, so excuse me for repeating it. And he had a, quite a nice car. Uh, and I looked at the wheels and I went, whoa, you know, and I opened up and you had that smell of leather and I'm not even going to tell you, the <laughs> it, it was a nice car. <laughs> I mean, holy mackerel. And I said, man, nice wheels. And he looked at me in all seriousness. He was an elder in the church I was going to. And he said, Fuel for the fires, just fuel for the fire. Fuel for the fire. Everything we have, it's all going to pass away. Everything that we're looking at is all going to pass away. No one knows the day or the hour except the Lord. And here we are. It gives you perspective because our eyes need to be on Him. Our eyes need to be on the Lord. Because that's, that's our destination. We're all going there, folks. We're all going there. There's no doubt. Nobody, 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 unless we're raptured. You know, you've heard this, the, there's only two certainties in this world, death and taxes. Well, I got news for you. If you got enough money, you may be able to avoid the taxes. At least for now. But you can't avoid death. No, you can't avoid that. That's going to come to all of us. The difference is that we have a hope. What man considers death is really the beginning of our life, the beginning of eternity. It's just that 
we haven't experienced it. And so it's really fascinating to me that Scripture tries to tell us in no uncertain terms that while we're to take our walk here seriously, while we're to take our life seriously, it's not the end all and be all. It's not, it's not the, it's not the, the final destination. Our final destination is the beginning of life eternal with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our final destination. Jacob believed that. Jacob had faith. Jacob was a man of faith. He'd wrestled the angel. You'll see in some of these verses, he starts drawing back. He, he wants to see Joseph. He needs to see Joseph because there's an important thing that hasn't been done. So verse 2. And Jacob was told, look, your son, Joseph, is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself, sick as he was, strengthens himself up on the bed, and he gets ready to receive him. Verse 3, Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an, after, as an everlasting possession. Jacob had faith. Jacob had faith that God would fulfill his promises. He would fulfill the promised seed. Israel was to be a great nation of people. He would fulfill the very special promised seed. The Savior of the world was to be sent to save the world. And he would fulfill the, pro the, the promised land. Canaan was to be given to Israel, which was a symbol that the promised land of heaven was to be given to believers of every generation. Do you get that? Do you get that? This is nothing but a symbol. The promise that Israel was given that they're going to receive the land is nothing more than a symbol that we have been given. We have a promised home. Our promised home is heaven. Our promised home is heaven. That's what our Lord opened up for us on Calvary. That's a really hard thing to consider every day, but it's something that really, as we grow, uh, Maybe because as we get older, we get closer to it. Or well, we see things. We see loved ones, people who we know and love who are no longer here, no longer with us. I mean, if, if this assembly was crowded with both 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock congregations, and everyone was here, and we started counting all the people that we have lost just this last year. Wow. We've lost some people. Heaven's gain. We've lost some people. Doesn't, miss we don't, doesn't mean we don't miss them. So it's extremely important that we take these verses and take them to heart. Jacob was acting in faith. He was acting in faith. Faith in God's great promises. Do you think about this? Do you think about these things? Of late, I've been thinking quite a bit. I was talking to my son just uh, a week ago, and we were chatting about things that were going on in his job and how frustrated he was about certain things, and we were talking, and, you know, and, and I said, and I happened to mention to him, Son, you're a pilgrim. This isn't, this isn't your final destination. It's not that you don't take these things somewhat seriously, but just remember, this is not... If you looked at it in perspective of your entire life, this doesn't mean very much. We get into quarrels. We get the, we get the irritated people. I know none of you do, but I get irritated all the time. 
I'm gonna who you know, and you go on a multitude of all kinds of things. And then the next day, I don't know, have you ever just kind of really been so upset you can't see straight? And then the next day you kind of go, Why was I so upset? Or wait a minute, the Lord doesn't call me to be upset like that. The Lord calls me to be gracious. What are we doing? Is it really worth severing? Is it worth tearing? Is it worth saying things that are going to hurt, that people are, are going to remember? We all do it. I'm talking about you, not me. I, I never do anything like that. This is serious stuff. It really is. And so he's starting to tell his son Jacob is starting to tell his son the promises that were given to him. These promises were given to me, and he starts recounting because these things are extremely important, and Joseph has got to remember all these things, and he is making preparations for getting underway, and he needs to start with Joseph and Joseph's sons. Verse 5. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring, whom you beget after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. Oh, this is big, and this is a big deal. He is legitimizing the children of Joseph. He's adopting the children of Joseph. Remember, they were born in Egypt. They have no place in the inheritance. So what he's doing is he's doing what he wanted his father to do, what he deceived his father to do, taking Esau's place. He is now giving to Joseph and his sons, particularly his sons. He is adopting Manasseh and Ephraim, making sure that they have an inheritance. So, this is, this is extremely important. This is formal, and it's very, very important. Because without this, they really had no place. They really had no place. It's so important, and with the faith that he had, that it's mentioned in Hebrews in 11:21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith. Why? Because you, he didn't have it. He didn't have Canaan. I mean, you know, you can't... You can't will what you haven't got. No, Jake, he knew. He knew he had been promised these, these things by God. So he was making sure that Joseph's sons had a place in this. And Joseph, through his sons, would inherit. And so jo uh, Joseph or is, has got to be standing there watching this and hearing this and going, whoa. And now he continues. And what he's basically saying is that your offspring after them will be put underneath. They'll have a share of Manasseh and Ephraim's inheritance. Okay? Verse 7, But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Then Israel saw Joseph's son, sons and said, Whose are these? Now, remember, Jacob is blind. He's got probably cataracts. He can't see, which means that the Lord gave him clarity at that time, at that moment, so he could see Joseph's sons. Because he says, Who are these? 
Imagine if you're dealing with someone who you know can't see and all of a sudden you're standing there with your, one of your children and they go, who's that? And I said, well, okay, here we go. Joseph said to his father, verse 9, Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, please bring them to me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. Interesting, isn't it? But he could. Then Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact God has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph. And he said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So you have Manasseh and you have Ephraim. And Joseph put Manasseh and Ephraim and what Israel did was went like that. Now Joseph is down here, okay, <laughs> listening to this blessing and then he looks up. This is important because Jacob asked God to bless Joseph's sons. Jacob asked God to make sure that they were called Israel, that they were accepted as true sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this was a formal statement of adoption so that the two sons would always be recognized as true sons of Jacob. They would therefore inherit their portion of the promised land. No one could take that away from them now. And Jacob asked God to make them a great multitude of people, that they be a part of the promised seed, the great nation of believers that God had promised. And now, Joseph looks up. Verse 17, Now when Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand on the, hand, the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. Now this is kind of interesting, don't you think? Because Joseph was the son who was given a coat of many colors. He was given the coat to rule. He was given a coat of favor. He was his father's favored. And he was, at that time, the youngest. He was the youngest. And here, his father is now making the youngest and giving the youngest favor. And he's saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. The oldest, hold it. You know, it's the oldest. Wait a minute. He's trying to, so he takes his hands and he's trying to switch his hands. And I found that interesting because if anyone should look at God's sovereign choices and, and recognize God's sovereign choices, it should be Joseph. He should be the one who should be, able, hey, you know, wow, this is, this is God's choice through my, through my father. This is God's choice. No, 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 wait a minute. No, no, it's the, it's the other one. It's the other one. But God works that way. Look at, look at the list. Seth was chosen before Cain, remember? Shem was chosen before Japheth, Noah's sons. Abraham was chosen before Haran. Isaac was chosen before Ishmael. Jacob was chosen before Esau. Ephraim was chosen before Manasseh. Moses was chosen before Aaron. Gideon was chosen before his brothers. 
And David was certainly chosen before his brother. That seems to be God's way. He doesn't work the way we work. He just doesn't work the way we work, does he? So I found that it was kind of interesting that here, you know, here's Joseph, of all people, trying to tell his father, wait a minute, no, 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 I want the, I want the oldest to inherit. I want the oldest to, to get preferential treatment. Maybe Egypt rubbed off on him? I don't know. That was kind of interesting. But look what happens. Verse 19, but his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And when you get into scriptures, you'll find that rather than saying Manasseh, you'll always say, you'll always hear Ephraim, 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 Ephraim. Our big problem is that we tend to try to push ourselves and our wants and our desires before the desires of the Lord. And the Lord doesn't work like we do. He doesn't choose like we do. He just doesn't. You don't know who he's going to lift up. You don't know who, how he's going to lift him up. I mean, Jesus was born in the stable. David was the runt of the litter. Gideon was like floored when he was chosen, right? When he was called. He kept asking the Lord, well, let me try this testing. Well, how about we do this? <laughs> how many of you have ever prayed and the Lord answered your prayer and it wasn't the way you expected it? And how many of you have, in your heart of hearts, looked up and gone, really? But I prayed for kind of like the old army joke, you know, if you wanted to do something, you didn't ask for that, you asked for the exact opposite, and then hopefully you got what you wanted. Because they always, you oh no, you, if you want to be a musician, they're going to make you a cook. So if you ask that you want to be a cook, they'll make you a musician, you know, a musician or something. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the truth. <laughs> just to blow me away. Constantly blow me away. You run into chemists and infantry units, you know. You're what? You have a what? A master's in what? And they're hefting rifles, you know. Then you go into the medics group and you find out somebody who just got out of high school and they threw him in the medic, you know, the medic corps for training. God doesn't work the way we work. He doesn't. His timing is not our timing. It's really tough in this walk that we're in. It's really difficult. It, I mean, it is just hard. I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, there's a part here where Jacob is saying and recounting all that's happened to him, and he, and he says the angel of the Lord, the angel that he wrestled with, it was God who he wrestled with. And he's giving glory to all these things. He's saying, look, this is, this is all happened. Look, look, look. Look back in your own life and see the wonders that God has done in your life. And give him the glory for it. Look back on the fact that we're all here, that you have homes and food. I, I get in my car, and you know, it's, it's funny because uh, we went to California a couple of weeks ago. We had some business to transact there, and, and uh, we, we got back and we happened to rent, uh, and we got a Cadillac. It was kind of a nice, hint. what do you know? It's nice to drive an American car that competes. Everything worked. It was comfortable. 
really, really neat. You know, we turn it in, and of course I get into my, my uh, I should say, our Avalon, you know, and it's uh, quite a number of years old, and it's not anywhere near as neat as the Cadillac was, you know, and you got, if you want to you hit your brake, you got to push a little harder on the brake. It's not quite as, you know, receptive as, as the, uh, or uh, maybe that's not the right word, but it doesn't react as quickly. There's a, there's a thing about it, though. It's paid for. It's paid for. So I started praising God. Lord, thank you. Thank you. This car is paid for. I wave my wife off as she goes shopping. She gets in the Explorer, and you hear it start. It's a Ford. And it catches. Thank you. It, it worked. And then she pulls on. It's paid for. Praise God. It's paid for. So I found myself thanking the Lord, saying, hey, you know, you don't have to drive the, the newest car. You don't have to be, you know, in the biggest house. You don't have you thank God for what you got. We eat. Look at the fellowship. We're still here. Here Sunday mornings, new people coming in and messages are... We're being fed. Praise God. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But we know where we're going, don't we? So that's awfully important. At least I think it is. Psalm 118, verse 8 to 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. I have news for you, church. In context here, understand that you put your trust in God. Don't put your trust in any party. Don't put your trust in Republicans. Don't put your trust in Democrats. They both betray us. <laughs> they both do. Put your trust in God. Don't put your trust in an elected official. Put your trust in God. And he's the only one that we can trust. That's why it's in the Word. Okay? Verse 20. So he blessed them that day, saying, By Israel will bless, by you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, notice it's Israel, not Jacob. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying. But God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. Now, this verse, I'm telling you, I went nuts researching. What did he mean by that? We don't read of him fighting with anybody. There's nowhere in Scripture that we read that Jacob took up a sword and bow and, and, and fought for land. But you notice that it goes to Shisham. What happened at Shechem? Jacob's sons, Simeon and Reuben and his sons, slaughtered the town, and they wound up with land. They wound up, essentially, with the town. So I thought, well, could that be it? Yeah, possibly. When you look at the table of patriarchs, you see Ephraim and Manasseh. Occasionally, they will switch Ephraim and Manasseh and put Joseph in there. But essentially, what Jacob did, what Israel did, is he put Ephraim and Manasseh over Reuben and Simeon because they got a double portion. Normally, you would give the eldest son the double portion. But remember, Reuben disqualified himself. He defiled his father's bed. And Simeon was a really rough character. He deceived using God's ordinance of circumcision. And so God's making things right. In the next chapter, we get all the characters. We get all the sons as, as 
Jacob makes his final preparations. But it's not inheritance that, you, that we're going to hear about. He's given the inheritance now. He's given the inheritance out. And yes, his brothers will all receive a share. But the thing that gets me here is J Jacob didn't see all this. This was all promised. But Jacob knew it was going to happen. When you read Hebrews 11, well, maybe we should go there, huh? Let's go to Hebrews 11. No, I don't have a slide for it, but that's all right. I tried not to overdo it with the slides this time. Uh, last time I had so many slides, I kind of was like, I felt bad for you constantly doing this. Uh, so this time. But let's go to Hebrews 11. The faith chapter. Twenty-one. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. Twenty-two. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the dis departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Both did not want to be buried in Egypt. We're not to stay in Egypt. We're not to be of the world. We are not to be of the world. They didn't see any of this. 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured us seeing him who is invisible. It's by faith. By faith. By faith. Sure, Moses didn't see Jesus. Jacob didn't see Jesus. Joseph didn't see Jesus. The patriarchs didn't see Jesus. But they knew he was coming. They knew he was coming. Faith takes courage. It takes courage to believe. It takes courage. And that's what he calls us to. And he gives us the Spirit, so that by that Spirit, he increases our faith and increases our courage. Because I know that by myself, there's no way that I would ever be able to stand in front of, a, in front of hungry lions. <laughs> but we know that that happened, don't we? We know that they went singing, don't we? That's the spirit. That's faith. And that's what we're called to have. We're called to remember that we have promises, that we are promised, that we have an everlasting life with him. And then we're to share that. We're not to hoard it. It's not so that we keep that here. We are to share it. And so I was struck by this passage because it really is, it's a preparation for an understanding that we're not going to be on this earth. Our future is not on this earth. Our future is in heaven with him. Our future is in heaven together. I don't know about you, but there are so many days that I kind of go like this. Let's hear the trump. Oh, Lord, let me hear it. Let's meet in the air. Wouldn't it be, what a trip, huh? What a trip that will be. Oh, Lord, glory. And we'll all participate. Either we're, we are there waiting for that to, to happen, or it's happening to us, and we'll be there. So whatever we're going through, whatever trials we're going through, whatever comes, it's not for very long. 18 years, we just talked about 18. How many remember September 11, 2001? You know exactly what you were doing. 18 years. 
Here we are 18 years later. Where'd it go? We came to this church five years ago last month. Actually, I started going to the men's group, I believe it was in June or May. Five years. Holy mackerel. It's going like that. It's going in a flash. Let's keep that in perspective. Let's keep that in perspective, especially when we have our clashes, especially when we, when we mess up. Forgive each other. Forgive, forgive yourself and forgive each other. Reconcile. That's what Jesus was all about, reconciliation. So I was, I was fascinated by this chapter. It was a, it, this was a very hard chapter for me to get through for some reason. And I, I for me to feel that I did justice, oh, Lord, no. This is, this is really, really a difficult, difficult thing because we live in this world and we do see so many things, but we're not to live by sight. We're to live by faith, right? We're to live by faith. We're to move out and step out in faith. We're to, we're to be those ark bearers that step out into the River Jordan. Remember, nothing happened until they stepped out. And that's what we're to do. We're to step out in faith. Otherwise, what are we doing here? Why are we listening to all this? What does it do for us if it, we don't allow it to change us? if we don't allow it to make us into his image. If we don't allow it to, to, and remember that we're here to bring him glory. That's our job, to bring our Lord glory. And he's worthy of it. He's worthy of all of it. Doesn't belong to us. So keep that in mind. Next, mo next week, we talk about the end. We talk about Jacob now bringing the rest of the cast in because we're getting near the beginning, or I should say the end of the beginning, the end of Genesis, and continuing our journey in this incredible book that changes our lives. It's changing our lives now. I don't know about you, but the Lord's been dealing with me on, with a whole bunch of stuff. I can't be the only one going through some stuff. Well, he's holding a mirror up, and I'm going, still? I thought I dealt with that. No. Still a little corner. No, I want it all. Get it all out. That's our God. A loving, gracious, almighty, powerful, saving Lord. So let's go to prayer. Our oh, Father and our God, we praise you. We thank you. Lord, we are just travelers in this pilgrimage. We're all going to come before you. We pray that you strengthen us and change us, conform us to the image of your son, Jesus. Break us. Help us to get rid of all the, all the dross, Lord, so that we can stand before you because we want to hear those words, oh, Lord, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. Guide our steps, protect and watch over us. Give us loving and forgiving hearts. And that doesn't mean we don't hold each other accountable because we are. We're accountable to each other. We're certainly accountable to you. All of us will give account, Lord, before you, what we do in your name and in this walk that we're in. And we look to that day and we give you praise and pray for your mercy, your help, your guidance. Pray for your healing hand to touch those of us who need your healing hand, pray for your encouragement for those who are discouraged, your strength, your mercy, that you do battle for us for those who are under attack, Lord, and, do, and, believe, and we know that we're under attack. We know that the battle is yours and the victory is yours. And we give you all the praise and the glory. Pray that you keep us safe until we come again Sunday to worship and praise you and hear your word. And we give you all the praise and the glory for this, Lord, and ask these things in Jesus' name. And I pray, now here, pastors are in, in, uh, will be in front here. Please come before the throne. Lay it before the throne. 
He's here waiting for us.